Achtung, Achtung, which is, of course, German for, oh, my God, what have we done? Um, 80 oh years ago. Oh, my God. My God. Oh, my God. 80 years ago, today, June yes. the 28th, 1942, the German armed forces launched Foul Blau, or Case Blue, the summer attack on southern Russia with the goal of capturing the oil fields of Baku. One of the biggest decisions of the war, it would result in, amongst other disasters, the loss of the entire German Sixth Army at Stalingrad. Um, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and James Holland. James Holland, who, uh, like an egg, I expect, is fried as a result of um, <laughs> the Chalk, Chalk Valley History Festival. Are you uh, are you sunny side up or over easy as a result, Jim? No, I'm definitely sunny side up. It was uh, it was a fantastic week, actually. And we saw loads of IC members, lots of people who yep. um, came up to me and told me how much they're enjoying the pod and Great. people from all over the place, people from all around the world. There was a guy who'd come from Florida. He was like, oh, my God, I just, you know, I, I love your podcast. Um, Chaz Mina was there as well, which is great uh, seeing brilliant. him. He was there for a whole week. So the guy from Florida wasn't Chaz; it was someone else. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, there were loads of people, and it was and it was it was lovely. And I had um, I had some of our you know friends of the show. Steve Prince was down. Brilliant. Um, I, I, I'd like to think we did PCA proud when we covered off his book. Steve and I. Yes, good. Um, and also, we were touched by royalty all week, which was rather nice. So we touched uh, by royalty. <laughs> touched by royalty. We had uh, the Duchess of Cornwall in person there on oh. Monday, which was um. What do you um, call her? Do you call her Your Majesty, Your Highness? No, you call her Ma'am. Ma'am. Ma'am to rhyme with jam. Hey, Ma'am. Hey, oh. Ma'am. All right, um, and, and so yeah, you call her that. Anyway, she was she was quite game, so that was very nice. And then oh, um, then we had Charles II, which was. Oh, particularly yeah. thrilling for me. I've always been a bit of a kind of you know Charles II Restoration man. So um, yeah. uh, that's what I that's what I studied for my my yes, of course. my thesis at um, um, oh. my dissertation at, at um, university. Yeah. Wow. And um, and then we have Richard III as well. Richard the Toid, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Dicky Toid. So we had him Toid. and um, and we had the uh, Beachhead Commandos. They were there and in, in very very good. Oh, song. I love them. They're great. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I've done a little video for the Patreon members, actually, with Max from the Beachhead Commandos, who right. taught me properly how to fill and smoke a pipe. Oh. It's not something I'm going to be doing, but I thought for that, those for a Second World War bent, I thought, you know, it's a central piece of kit. You haven't developed a pipe habit as a result? No, I haven't. I'm, no, I'm not, no. I haven't, to be honest. But but it, it, it's, it's <laughs> really fantastic, because uh, I do like the smell of a pipe, though. Yeah, well, I, I'm, you know, yeah, I quite like the smell of a pipe. Down the street. Or- or yeah, you know, tobacco like uh, like a cigar. I find cigar like the smell of. Yeah, but I've no in no interest whatsoever in uh, filling myself up with the stuff. But there you go. No, um, no, me neither. So no, that was um, good, and and it was lots of it was lots of good stuff. It was great. Yeah, the colonel enjoyed himself. He said, um, "Yeah, it was nice. It was nice to see um, Colonel and Mrs M." Yeah, um, that, yeah, they they were in good good form. So yeah, yeah, no, it's been a great week actually. It has been a fantastic week. The, 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 I mean, this is obviously a massive digression, but the the death of Richard Irving was absolutely amazing. Was it? And, and, yeah, just bear with me a second because what they yeah. what they've done is obviously they've got the skeleton. If you assume yeah. that that is Richard the Third, it's got lots of wounds on it. Yeah. So if you combine the wounds with eyewitness accounts, with knowledge of the battlefield, right, and with you forensic can, archaeology, you can start a yeah. knowledge of the weapons and 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 fighting tactics of the day what you can do is you can work out exactly how he died and what the, happened, and the, the, what happened the, the moments and how it all went wrong and why he ended up dead and it was so they did it they had a, they had richard third on his horse in his armor and they had all yeah. the kind of people with the with the bill hooks and pikes yeah. and staffs yeah. and axes and yeah. all the rest of it yeah and they walked through it really closely talking through every single bit of it Right. And sort of doing it in slow mo, so you saw, you know, Richard would parry, but it would all be done in sort of, you know, barely touching someone else. It would just yeah. sort of slow mo. It's just going through the the, the yeah. actual movements rather than the kind of sort of physical hard crash. Yeah. And, then, and so they talked it through, and then he went, right, let's do it in real time. And it was just like bam, 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 the like blizzard. Dead. Right. Oh wow. God, it was it was absolutely fantastic. And right. I think that's when living history can really work, really work, yeah, really, yeah. really well. It was yeah. it was really compelling. Oh. So anyway. So you know, and it's good to sort of remind, remind myself that there is more history than just the Second World War. No, no, there's not. There's not. There's, <laughs> there's nothing. Quite, that's where you're quite wrong, Jim. Um, <laughs> oh, and I did my and I did my talk to the kids of my mnemonic. Oh um, yeah, of scary times. Um, yeah, which I was quite pleased about. Yeah, so, um, yeah. And I use and I use your model Firefly for that. Oh, bless you. Because obviously, what times T tanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, yeah, absolutely, excellent. Now, um, I mean, uh, what? Well, uh, what was your 
What what Second World Wars apart from your talk for the school kids? What Second World War stuff did you have at at um, at Chalk this week? Well, we had a Second World War morning, which is something we always do. So we had Rob Lyman came and um, right. um, Steve Prince and I did the encirclement of Kiev. Yeah, and then we had Des right. Curtis. Yeah, it was just incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had the garrison down going through yep. the motions. Right. Um, Brilliant. They've been trying to persuade me to buy a Bedford MW all week, which I was very, very close to. So much so that I actually rang the bloke today. All right. I was thinking my birthday's going really badly. I, I know I cheer myself up by buying a Bedford. <laughs> But it's sold. <laughs> sold yesterday morning. Ad went out six a.m. yesterday morning. It was sold by seven, and it's gone. Well, oh yeah. well. Well, that's a, that way. You missed opportunity there to, to park next to the Dodge. I, I mean, yeah. But on the other hand, I'm, do you know what? I'm secretly quite relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I really want one and everything, but you know, a Dodge is probably enough. I think your Dodge and a Lloyd Carrier. It's probably it's probably and plenty. A I mean, uh, uh, just just for anyone um, who doesn't know, um, we've got our own little his um, uh, history festival coming up. Well, it's not little. Um, uh, Jim's turning his tanks east um, uh, yes. to We Have Ways Fest, a magnificent weekend for anyone with an interest in great speakers, military hardware, big bangs and tankards of frothing ale, including a pint of flying dustbin. It takes place near Silverstone Racetrack in Buckinghamshire, 22nd of July to the 24th. For details on speakers, hardware and how to get tickets, go to wehavewaysfest.co.uk. That's wehavewaysfest.co.uk. Um, and we're putting together... All, all sorts of stuff. Um, if you're a regular listener, you're probably, you're probably aware of um, what we've been doing with the festival and what we did last year. Um, but if you're new, I thought we should, you know, a little trail of tiny breadcrumbs because there are, there are new listeners. I was, um, I was accosted in Edinburgh um, in a hotel lobby on Well, I was Friday. just about to ask you about your Scottish trip. How's that been? Um, it was, it's really, really good. But I tried to go to the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards Museum at Edinburgh Castle. And the problem is, is it's in the middle of a, bloody tourist attraction isn't it so you you have to book mm. a slot to get into the castle to get to that museum so you i, I you know i stroll right. up the i strolled up the royal mile thinking oh, i'll just i'll just well, without many in. people in the royal scots Dragoon guards museum well it, well exactly but you the have to get in. into you have to get into the museum and i got there at sort of two and the next slot was half past three and you think ah god damn it oh, wish i'd planned it a bit better um but yes we know we, we we were in dundee what did we do? Dundee, Edinburgh. We had a day off in Edinburgh and then uh, Dunfermline on Saturday and Aberdeen last night. Wow. So we just, just got That's back a good effort. So you got back already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's that whole oh, business. Nice. It's that whole business as well of, um, you know, uh, when we drove we drove from, from Dunfermline to Aberdeen, it never got dark, you know. Um, yes, of course. It's sort of still light like to half bit 11, further, A little it? bit further north, yeah. 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 And um, how was it? How were our Scottish friends? Uh, they were great. They were great fun. Yeah, it was really, it was really, really hey, good fun. Good for you guys. Yeah, and we had a very nice evening shore leave um, in Edinburgh on uh, Friday night. Which oh, it's is, such um, a great city, isn't it? Yeah, it's an amazing place. It's an amazing place. And actually, yeah. um, a, friend of, a friend of mine, Harry Bell, came to see you, and he said it was brilliant. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, should have got him to come say hello. Now, um, I've been reading um, uh, this this David French book. Go um, on. Uh, uh, what's it called again? It's it's got a it's got a very serious name: Deterrence, Coercion, and Appeasement: British Grand Strategy, nineteen thirty nine to nineteen forty. And oh, it's, that, it does sound interesting. It's bloody good. And he is says, it? basically, he says, basically, there's this, it, there is a problem with um, the historiography and there and, and the history of, um, of the, of, of appeasement, which is that it's very often people start the clock in 1937 and they don't do, or 1933 or 1931 or something. Right. And what they don't do is take into account everything that's been going on in the 20s and the, the sort of foreign, poli foreign policy dead ends and attempts by attempts by, you know, you know, Lloyd, Lloyd George nearly gets into a war in 1921 over Turkey, you know, and stuff like that. Tries to get the, yes. Greeks, to, the Greeks to leverage against the, the Turks and all this sort of stuff. And there's just this stuff going on. And that, the Lloyd George government. Ireland, falls. Of course. Well, yeah, but the Lloyd, well, exactly. And the Lloyd George government falls over the over the, the Turkey thing. Right. Yep. And and so when people talk about, you know, the, the, the context of appeasement within the fact that there's no appetite for war, there's no there is no appetite for war. Um, and the whole of British policy in the 20s is very much shaped by this. And you get into this. Also, you've got he's also, he also talks an awful lot about, you know, naval naval strategy and what naval what the what the Admiralty want and what the British government knows it can afford. And so that the only power they're going to allow to um 
to to match them um you know uh, uh, in terms of naval strength is america that's the only power they can really afford to allow and uh, and and yet what they really but they also really, 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 they're really scared of the Americans for this, for this very same reason. And they really? get into this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very cautious of the Americans in the 1920s. They really don't know because they, 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 they get also get into a political tangle about war debt. And they try to say to the Americans, and there's echoes of this after the Second World War as well, where they're going, come on, we fought this war for a lot longer than you did. You've done very well out of it. Surely the debts can, can, um, can wait. Seems reasonable. I mean, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, but but you know, Hank, and it's Morris Hankey is the guy who runs. Yes, runs as a sort of stick, like a like like stick. He's rock the chancellor, isn't he? He becomes well, he, the chancellor. Well, exactly. But he's but he's. Or it, I mean, this book relies quite heavily on his diary, one of his uh, on his diaries. But he he says to Ramsey MacDonald in 1935, the United States are one a most dangerous potential enemy. Two, a most damaging neutral if hostile. Three, a most helpful neutral if friendly. For a most powerful ally, for these reasons, we ought never risk a quarrel with them. And this is wow. this this then gets the British then get in a tangle about about how to repay their debts to the US because there's a bit there's a slice of American a British political opinion that's going we shouldn't have to repay the debts. It's you know like we did our bit, we fought hard, and basically the big thing that's happening in the twenties and the thirties is the British political establishment getting used to the idea it's no longer financially ascendant in the world that the, the empire may have expanded to the to its biggest limit ever but essentially britain isn't what it was before the first world war you know because it was a it was a lending power before the first world war and by the end of the first war it's borrowing power and it's just absolutely fascinating you know, that you've got that going on with the US where they're freaking out about how to keep the US on side. Why do and, they think that the US might be a potential threat? Well, be because, you know, because they're English speaking, they're democratic. Because I mean, of its sheer be? power. Because of its sheer power. You just absolutely can't get yourself into a position where, they, where things go sour with the US. That, you know, if, they, if, if they're a damaging neutral, if they're hostile, they're, you know, you, you've got to keep them absolutely bosom tight. Right. And then basically, when, when, when they, they have the naval talks, the Americans go, oh, we're not interested in building a navy. And the Aboriginal are like, oh, thank, thank for, for that. You know, that, a lucky escape. And it, it, it's, it's just really, really interesting because he says, unless you've, unless you've put all of the processes, that, that all of these decisions and all of these pressures in, you know, take them all into account before you then start talking about appeasement. You, you, you're getting it wrong. And, and he's really brilliant on um, Eden. Eden. Eden basically thinks, no, the way to contain the Germans is not to try and do a deal with them. Because Chamberlain always thinks what you can do is you do a, you do a deal with the, with the dictators and, yeah. and, and that, will, that will contain them. And Eden's attitude is, no, you do deals with everyone else to contain them. Yes. And, and that's the central place they fall out. That's the central plank of why, in the end, they have to part company. Chamberlain and, and Eden. Chamberlain and Eden. Because Chamberlain thinks what you do is you go in and you, you go see you the shrews. dictators and, and you solve the problem that way by looking them in the eye and treating them like a, honest brokers. Um, whereas what Eden is thinking is, how do I, how do we arrange a thing that contains them. So it doesn't matter what the Germans do, they're contained. Okay, so that's interesting because Ukraine, Russia, that the, the EU and America are taking the Eden approach. Yeah. Well, or NATO is basically the Eden approach, isn't it? Yes, yes. Containment of the Soviet Union. Which well, is that's one of the big the arguments about appeasement is, is that, yeah. you know, had you created a series of alliances around Europe at the time, yeah. Yeah. you know, with Czechoslovakia, yeah. with... With Poland, with Belgium, with you know Scandinavia, yeah. all those countries, yeah, it, it would have been a non-starter for Germany. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the problem is, I suppose, there was all those those alliances in, and entanglements in 1914 yes. in place. Exactly, and that's the, and that's the warning, isn't it? Well, exactly. you know what happened last time. Exactly, exactly, and that that's that's exactly what's going on here. If only someone had gone and talked to the Germans in 1914, um, and we we dealt with them, dealt with their whatever their grievances were. Maybe we'd have avoided this whole thing. But what's really interesting, the other thing that's really interesting is is the you know uh, um, the point he makes is that when when um, uh, Chamberlain's making his assessments, a general election is a certainty, right? 
There right. always will be a general election that he has to go to the polls and win. Right. So that what I mean, what he says is another war is a possibility. Another general election is a certainty. Yes. Right. So, and that's the that's the, the uh, domestic political pressure that Chamberlain's under. He's not thinking there's certainly going to be a war with the Germans. He's thinking, what can I do? What can I do? Because there's an election coming because I, I will face an election in three years time. You know, because he starts off in a very strong, very, very strong position in 37 when he becomes prime minister. You know, he's incredibly popular. He's regarded yeah. as an extremely safe pair of hands, very yeah. confident, sound judgment. Well, excellent. he had done a good job in back in the, in, in the Navy and the and Air yeah. Force. I mean, what does David yeah. French say about that? Does he agree? Yeah. Well, yes, he does. Yeah, yeah, he does. He says that, you know, that they're, get, they're getting things on track. And after all, they're getting things on track after a decade, essentially, of of everyone trying not to spend um, militarily because a, because war is war is war is obviously profoundly unfashionable as a result of the first world war. But secondly, no one can afford it. No one can afford the rearmament that, 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 that they're trying to commit themselves to right. or, or, or say they're going to commit themselves to and then wriggle out of. And that's how you end up with a 10 year rule. You know, like um, you've got to avoid spending the money and it's about money, the twenties, all of it. And, and it, and that's the situation. What, because so, you're, because you've got the, you've got the huge war debt of the first world war. Yeah. And then you're just starting to sort of get to grips of it, and you have the Great Depression, and, and yeah, I suppose yeah, you get to Britain, yeah. you've got the general strike, haven't you? Yeah, 1926. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huge and amount it, of armor, and also huge, um, huge agricultural depression. Yep, yep. So there's yep. lots of there's lots of disruption and discord. In fact, actually, it's not yeah. at all dissimilar to current times, is it? Yeah, yeah. And the chiefs of staff keep saying, "Look, we can rearm if you want, right? But we'll overheat the economy." Well, well, it's expensive. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, obviously what we want to do is fight an enemy. We want to take the Germans on when they're not ready for the long term, which generally they never are, is the, is the assessment. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's fascinating. But then at the same time, you've got Vansittar at the same time saying, look, it cannot be concealed that the conception of war occupies an entirely accepted and natural place in the development and future extension of the Third Reich. He's saying, look, you know, um, Goering and the authors of Krieg in Permanence have told us that the, what they want is a war they to create a Weltreich. You know, that, uh, and Vansittar gets fired for offering this kind of analysis. Right. And, and Cadogan comes in, you know. Yeah, and yeah. It, and, 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 but it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And there's just a really, really interesting stuff as well about how, you know, in 38, they get spending again. But one of the things, one of the things, um, uh, uh, <laughs> one of the things that uh, Chamberlain's really concerned about is using, using the rearmament basically to keep the engineering industry going. And, and so, so they disperse some of it in order to get the skills, keep the skills ticking over in, in smaller engineering firms. And then once things are up and running, they're going to take those contracts back off those firms because they're up and running again. And they can they can take on, you know, as the economy begins to recover, they don't need. Is that, the is that a good, I mean, is that a good or bad idea? Well, I, well, I, I don't know. But, but, but sometimes it's but, but, but that's in the mix of the bit where suddenly Chamberlain's rearming. And isn't that a good thing? But Chamberlain's also rearming to sort of juice the economy a bit. He's. He's you because he's a chancellor. He's looking yes, at it with his chancellor's brain. Yeah. You know, he's thinking, how can I, how can I pull some financial muscle uh, strings? Well, there is, the, but there is no question that it. You know, having a um, a, a large defence doesn't necessarily mean you're bankrupting yourself. No, because you are creating jobs. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, look at America in 1940. Yeah, I mean, emerging out of depression, what you do is you create a huge armaments industry, and uh, yeah. it, uh, and America becomes rich again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know it, it, it can work. I mean, yeah. But it, but is is I mean I think it's fascinating all this stuff about sort of g going further back to the nineteen yeah. twenties. But but is he pointing any fingers against? No no no. It's not a guilty men book. It's not a guilty men book. <laughs> it's just a kind of this is what happened. We need it, to think yeah. of it in a broader context. Well, and we need to think of it in, in a broad in the broader context of British gr gr British grand strategy. You know, uh, and 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 it, uh, at the start of the book he says, "Is there such a thing anyway? What does anyone mean by strategy at this point? Is this a word that's current?" Is it is grand strategy a phrase that's one that's being knocked about? Because he says uh, one of the interesting things he says is you know when, when you, you look at post Cold War, it, has there been any British strategy? Is, you know, British foreign policy sort of staggers from staggers from strange decision to strange decision. And he says, yeah. but is that any different? And then he get, and he's saying, is that any different anyway? Because because you've got you know like I say, you've got Lloyd George thinking he needs to get into a war with the Turks, 
at one point regarding the you know and not having the not having any political gas in the tank to pull that off Ireland going you know and Lloyd George is what Lloyd George wants to do in Ireland you know he's saying let's put the place to the sword if that's what we've got to do you know he's yeah. his, his yeah, track yeah, record really I mean, his track record on that is, is, too. It's, it's amazing, really, what he's proposing to do. And, but, yeah. and, and again, again, there is a lack of appetite, not just, not just politically, but in the army, in the military as well, for this sort of thing. Because yeah. they know how difficult it is. And you've got what's happening in India going on. And he, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and huge amounts of empire policing Exactly, to do and what you do about Singapore and, and how Africa. you remain... Well, and, and, how you, and how you remain engaged with the Dominion governments, who, after all, have all got their own view of... Uh, of what the First World War was for them and what they yep. got out of it and whether it was worth it and whether they're going to carry on spending. And you've got this endless thing as well with the, with the you know, um, Australia, New Zealand, knowing that they need help if, if, they're going, if, if Japan is going to become a problem. Although the Australians also have always historically been worried about China. You've got all this stuff. So he says, so he says if you just focus on what's going on in appeasement and you don't, you don't, a Chamberlain in appeasement, you don't place it in a 20 year context and you don't place it in a global context. You can't understand it. Mm. You can't. You can't get to grips with it. And also, how you know? So by by 1938, when Munich's going on, he says that you know British policy policymakers and, and and their French counterparts are basically completely addicted to worst case scenario thinking. Yeah. So all of their assessments of what the Germans can do militarily in 38 around Munich are that the, they can't that they the, they can't defeat the Germans. That that London will be firebombed and destroyed. They're completely hung up on all this worst case scenario stuff. Well, again, I mean that that has also has echoes of today, doesn't it? Because because yeah. hovering in the background is this nervousness that Russia is going to kind of send over a nuke or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, or, be, or be, be, before the Ukraine war, that the Russians would simply roll over the Ukrainians. Yeah. You know that it would be over very 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 quickly. And, and, and it's well. I've got to know, say, this is one of the reasons why I'm largely very sympathetic to Chamberlain because I, I think you know you put yourself in Chamberlain's shoes in 1938. Yeah, yeah. And you think about the gargantuan decisions he's got to make. You know, if he gets this wrong, if he calls it wrong, and you send people into war before Britain's ready. Forget whether your enemy's ready. Yeah. It's, are you ready? It's it's not. Yeah. Well, and you know, also, you, well, you're a democratic politician, so he's, yes, and 90 percent of the country is against you going to war. So. Yeah. You know what but, do you but do? He says, but he says the core problem of what happens in Munich is ministers ignore the cardinal lesson of British grand strategy: that diplomacy without the backing of force is unlikely to be effective. That it's as simple as that. That the that that Ch Ch Chamberlain goes for assurances from Hitler without the without deterrence backing him. Right, he, 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 and that's why he can only fail because he yes he, 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 yeah that makes really good sense. I whatever his intentions. Whatever his political, um, you know, positioning, whatever advice he's getting, the fact is, is he's is he's going to get assurances out of Hitler, and he has no way of. Uh, there's no backstop. He's no no way of actually. Well, the, the, I, but except an economic blockade against Germany. Well, exactly. But 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 force is the force is the. Is you know, the you're trying to stop someone going to war. Force is the way to stop them going to war, isn't it? Rather than economic sanctions or whatever. We, again, if, you, if, we, if we're going to parallel it with Ukraine and Russia, I mean, you could you could see that too. But could you, could Chamberlain not have said in nineteen, you know, in, a, in, a, in you know, you have to understand the moment you go into Czechoslovakia. No, but the, his problem is he's, he's being told we can't do, we can, we can't do anything. We 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 can't do anything. Anything we do will be ineffective. We don't have what, the what, stuff. What, what about an economic blockade vote? Well, that that's military ba balance of power is the question. Around it, everything's Are everything's. You? So, yeah. so Chamberlain is being told that whatever happens, whatever there's nothing do, we can don't. do about it. Yeah, but yeah. that's extraordinary because I, I would argue that that isn't the case. Yes, well, exactly. Well, but 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 that isn't the case because the Germans are weaker than people think they are. It's not. It's yes, but it, but, but even it's if that even way if they, round. But even if they're weaker than they think, I mean, even if they're stronger than they think they are, it's not like we haven't got any. You know, Britain hasn't got any yeah. aces. Yeah, yeah. It's got the world's yeah. largest navy. You know, yeah, the, the, yeah. that is. Irrefutable. Yeah, but that's a that's got global commitments, and you and you think you're broke, and you've pursued a, a you know a policy of twenty yes. years of, of basically trying to keep the lid on everything. Because because I mean, one of the points French French makes is after all, you know, so that the British finance is so is such an important interest to the British that any you what you're trying to do is avoid disrupting it. That the maintain maintenance of the state status quo is the most important thing to keep British trade and finance going, 
right? Mm. Um, and, and any disturb, you know, it's um, uh, you know, nineteen twenty six is a secret br- briefing paper that goes um, uh, for the chiefs of staff only who've only just been constituted, right? And the Foreign Office explain why peace is in Britain's interest, which I mean, obviously sounds sort of absurd. But it, but but what? Because of course it is, duh. Well, yeah, exactly. The fact is that war and rumours of war, quarrels and fiction in any corner of the world spell loss and harm to British commercial and financial interests. It's for the sake of these interests that we endeavour to pour oil on troubled waters. So manifold and ubiquitous a British trade and finance that whatever else may be the outcome of a disturbance to the peace, we shall be the losers. So, and I think I think that's quite. And that's interesting in itself because, you know, very often people say, oh, you know, war's good for business. And they're saying war is bad for business. War is terrible for business. We can't we can't have war, you know. But but is that necessarily true? I mean, well, who knows? I not mean, in the case of America. Well, no, not in the in the in the long durée. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know, there's all these talks of, about sort of raising defence spending now, you know, yeah. in, in the US and, and in Germany yeah. and France and, and UK, obviously. Yeah. And everyone's going, oh, no, we can't possibly do that. Can't possibly do that. You know, yeah. Chancellor's saying it's absolutely unconscionable. Can't, of course we can't do yeah. that. Yeah. And yet, you know, even in the dark days of the sort of late 70s, yeah, defence spending was, what was it, 5% or something? Yeah. You know, with huge bases everywhere and in Germany yeah. and all over the yeah. place yeah. and huge, huge yeah. numbers of jets and... yeah. You know, so even in the darkest times, you can you can do these things. So I yeah. don't know. I, I sort of, you know, I kind of think if you need to spend money on defence and you're a you're your first world kind of you know global superpower, then I think you can. Yeah, you just got to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds really really interesting. So this is de- deterrence, coercion, and appeasement. Yeah, yeah. But just it's, to, to you your know. point on grand strategy. Sorry, just your your point about grand strategy. It's interesting because I, I think grand strategy means foreign policy. National yeah. foreign policy. That's what yeah. it means in this context. And, and the reason he's talking about grand strategy is because that is the term that they would have used in the 1930s. Well, and also he's so trying to, to but, it, but, it, but, it's, but it's because it's got, strategy implies, I think, also sort of a military tilt. So it's what you do militarily yes. in the world. Yes. Um, I mean, what he's really, you know, the 10-year rule, he's fascinating about it. He says, um, while a decade's grace may have seemed plausible, there is no evidence that Churchill based it on any st- detailed staff appreciation. He just picked that's a number amazing. out of the hat, went for it. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Rather, it is more likely that it was a nice round figure that he plucked out of the air, and it was one that the prime minister, ha- prime ministers, happily adopted. The point I was going to make was, was that you know, obviously, it's the, the official histories of the Second World War, and there's these multiple volumes, and there's uh, the campaign volumes, and there's the, the, the yeah. Mediterranean, the Middle East series, and there's yeah. North, there's Europe, um, there's J- war against Japan, etc., bomber command, blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, but there's also the grand strategy series. Volumes yeah. one to six, yeah, uh, and it's fascinating. And volume one it does go into the nineteen twenties. It absolutely does, and it does talk about yeah. the ten year rule and and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, um, but I'm sure that's why David French is is aping that is because, yeah, I, I, and also to a certain extent, I mean, in the nineteen twenties and thirties, grand strategy did mean military strategy, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it did. It I did. mean, that is foreign uh, policy. Uh, uh, well, if you're a naval colonial power, that, then it just does. That that that's if you're a naval power, it just. I mean, it inevitably is, isn't it? Big I mean, picture it's, stuff. It, yeah, it, it's. I mean, it's it's very very interesting though, though, because he because he you know I I think you do because after all, twenty years isn't that long, is it? I mean, it's twenty years more than twenty years since nine eleven, isn't it? And and you think you look at the the, the twists and turns in those sort of twenty one twenty one years. In, in what you would call British grand strategy or foreign policy in this country. It's that distance, but you can't explain where you are now without knowing what happened 20 years ago, you know. And I think to, to try and explain what's really going on, in, if you're trying to explain what's going on in 1938 in terms of grand strategy, you, you, you can't ignore, you know, 90, what's happening in the 20s. And, you know, the, 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 this after all, Ireland is a, is a massive blow to imperial prestige and very much very much, you know, creates a, a feeling that you can you can break away if you want. You don't need to stick around. It's a big fillip to it, Indian nationalists and, and, and Indian independence people. The idea that Ireland, you know, which is right under Britain's nose, breaks away is a is a that's a it's a big bloody thing. I mean, it's it's, it's very very interesting. This though, it's, um, I mean, uh, um, you know, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and and the, the, there's the Inskip report, which is this thing that that. That keeps that keeps coming up in this book as well. It's just fascinating where 
He's he's going, this is what you can spend. This is what you need to spend. This is how much you've got. This will be the effect on this bit of the economy or that bit of the economy. What you need to do, you know, which, which basically which which levers you can pull. And 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 then <laughs> and Chamberlain in the end doesn't like the advice, so fires him. <laughs> like, that, yeah, that's not helping. Well, that's his prerogative, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We just need to take a quick break. We'll be back in a second. And I just want to let you know about a virtual Battlefield tour I'm doing this evening. This evening. Uh, that's Tuesday, the 28th of June at 7.30pm. A virtual Battlefield tour. Um, it's to do with the Sherwood Rangers. And it's this bit where they're in um, in Normandy in June 1944. So it's Point 103, fontenay le Penel, Christo, John Semkin meets his tiger, the attack on Roray Ridge, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's been done through... Um, Dan Hill, who's done an absolutely incredible job um, weaving drone footage with original maps, with black and white aerial photographs merged with today's landscape. And I promise you, it looks absolutely stunning. So if you want to come and um, watch that, do tune in. Um, if you go onto um, the National Army Museum website, which is nam.org. .uk. So that's N-A-M dot A-C dot U-K. Um, and if you look at what's on, um, click on the what's on button. Um, that will lead you straight there. But um, do join if you can. I think we're only going to do it the one time. So it's a, it's a pretty unique thing um, and it's pretty special. Cheers. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with uh, James and me. Uh, we're talking all sorts of stuff. Digressions galore. Where do, where do you sit on Chamberlain? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I sort of, uh, in my reading of it, the problem is, is that you get this, you get this thing where he starts taking, pooling less advice, pooling less opinions. And he becomes more and more, you know, he basically takes over foreign policy. He's not, he's not listening to his foreign ministers. He's not really listening to the foreign office because they're not telling him what he wants to hear. And he gets rid of people who are going to argue with him, like Van Sittar, and it and it his his pool of opinion shrinks, and so his ability to assess um, the situation that he's facing dimin diminishes consequently. And so I think by the time he thinks he's pulling a rabbit out of the hat in Munich, the advice he's getting is so sort of um, narrow, narrow, yeah, um, that he so he's become he, completely blinkered. He can't do the big picture. He also, for, 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 for all the while that he's got people advising him militarily in a worst case scenario way, he's, he's thinking, man. well, yeah, f but, but they're, they're, they're wrong, like with their worst case scenario assessments of what the Germans are capable of. But he's also, he's not thinking in terms of worst case scenario in the way he deals with Hitler. He's, think, he's giving him the benefit of the doubt, and he's, mm. or the dictators rather. He's thinking he can use Mussolini as an intermediary. And this is all about trying to keep the plate spinning you know, not trying to avoid an encounter because, after all, that's better than a war. But but it's this it's this simple thing. You know, Van Sittart knows that 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 that, that the Nazis are geared to war and that, that 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 they're talking about having a war, one way or another. But Chamberlain just can't believe it. And the problem is, I think, because he's because he's narrowing down the number of people he talks to, he's that opinion's never going to get into his bubble. It's yeah. never going to make give him pause, and yeah. I think, I mean, I remember when we, I remember when we had Dan Tobin on the on the podcast long a long time ago, and I said, you know, who else is there? Anyone else who could have done what Churchill did? And he went, yeah, absolutely. British establishment chock full of those sort of people, right? Absolutely jam jam packed with those sort of people. His capabilities and and, and all that and and historic strategic view, yeah, whatever. Yes, absolutely, right. And I think the same is in pretty much any British politician by 1938, frontline Tory politician, would have got themselves in this tangle as well. So I don't know that it's necessarily Chamberlain. I think the situation, and if you've not been paying attention to the Germans, because after all, you know, you don't, you, 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 governments find it hard to divine the intentions of other governments very often, don't they? They find it very, very difficult. I mean, as we've again, as we've seen, you know, like a, 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 a in in recent months, and I think in the end, Chamberlain Chamberlain's mis misapprehension of what the what the Germans German government about the Hitler government's about would probably had it, had had Eden been prime minister, I think he'd have got himself in this same mess. 
if he'd actually been in charge of what on earth to do in 1938 about about concessions on the Sudetenland. I think he may have got himself in this mess as well. Because after all, it's all very well Eden talking about enrolling the Americans to sort of uh, 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 as a bulwark against the Germans. The Americans aren't interested. No. Um, no, they're absolutely not. In fact, and there, and there is, a lot there of them is, thinking, thinking Hitlerism is quite good. Well, uh, well, and there, and there is, there, there is some turn fro um, uh, with Roosevelt, with um, uh, Roosevelt and uh, and Eden. But the, but the problem is, is basically um, uh, uh, Chamberlain's not interested. So you know, <clears throat> uh, you know, there's this, 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 this. I think anyone else in Chamberlain's position would have done the same. Pretty yeah, much, that's really interesting. especially as, and, and you know, you've got to come back to the fact that, that a, a, a war is a possibility, an election is a dead cert. There will be a general election in the November of 1940. There has to be. So whatever you're doing in 38, you know, after all, British governments famously are always worried. You always know in the middle there's a dip and then what you're trying to do is get things to upswing as you come towards an election. And maybe that's 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 obviously part of his calculation as well because he's thoroughly he's a machine politician, Chamberlain. He's a yeah, I mean, one of the criticisms animal. about him is that you know he hasn't had any any military service. He's he's not so sort of attuned to it. But the, yeah, uh, and and the, there's no question about that. You know, he doesn't have yeah. that kind of military understanding, that that absolute love of history that someone like Churchill does. Yeah. Flip side of that is you know his military advisor. The, the way it's set up is is it's still Hastings Ismay who ends up. Yeah. Becoming, he's Hastings is made in nineteen in September nineteen thirty nine. He's not military um, advisor, military chief of staff to to the prime minister, but but no. he effectively is. It's just yeah. it's not until Churchill comes along that he actually gets called yeah. that. But but yeah. but he is working in Hastings Ismay is working yeah. in Whitehall with a team of colonels and military people advising yeah. the cabinet, yeah, yeah, and the prime minister. So there's yeah. there's really not much difference actually. No. No, uh, I, I mean, mean obviously, I, I, once I, I, you get into a war, I mean, one of the problems, you know, one of the big problems that Churchill has, and why there's so much faffing about, you know, what do you do about Germany, is because of France being so riven by, yeah. by yeah, its, yeah. its feeble domestic politics, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. by these coalitions, you know, these multi-party yeah. coalitions, yeah. and because we're in a formal alliance, it's not like our, our relationship with the United States, which is a coalition. France is a formal, yeah, yeah. signed on the dotted line ally. And you can't, yeah. you can't do, undertake yeah. mining the of French, the Leeds, invasion of Sweden, mining of the River Rhine, but, unless yeah. both parties are, are going, French, okay, but yes. The, but the French, he also put, he sort of points out, the French are also thinking, yeah, 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 you're talking about Europe now, but, but perfidious Albion, you know, Br Britain's reputation. Um, it's not great. Uh, <laughs> He, outside, outside what it thinks of. I mean, there's it, a very, it's, there is a funny section of this. It's a funny section of this book, which is all these British um, uh, politicians describing what, what, what a sort of moral, um, uh, you know, our moral position is unassailable, you know, and uh, we're yes. the, the British Empire is the sheet anchor of the world. Yeah. Um, you know, and all, all this, basically all this stuff. And the rest of the that world is absolutely is going, believed by a huge number of people. Oh no, it's 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 yeah. It's that's not hyperbole. That's that's no. not jingo. I mean, it is jingoism by today's standards. But but that is what people believe. It, well, no, it completely it completely informs um, how they get, think they're going about their um, uh, foreign policy. It completely informs yeah. their attitude. And the rest of the world is going, oh god, they're bloody British again. You know, like that they're. Mm. They're com the, 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 uh, standing, but, but you can see, can't you, that when it comes to it comes to military operations, France is going bloody British, you yeah. know. Okay, they were allies last time. They came, yeah. you know, and they, they strut around thinking they're in the yeah. place. But look at the size of our army. Look at theirs. Yeah. You know, yeah. who's doing the lion's share here? So obviously, yeah. they have the you know in their in the French mind's eye, they have the majority vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're yeah. stymied by their, the, you know, by by the. The, the divisions within their politics and this yeah. huge part multi-party coalition yeah and yeah. sort of you know yeah god knows how many but prime ministers they, I mean, in you, three years and all the rest of it yeah i mean it's just look um you know lord cruz the ambassador to paris he says um without boasting about national morality i think we can claim that our standard of concerted action is in this respect different from that of our friends here he's saying the french the french are no good and then and then you know, but then when you get into what other countries think of Britain, it's really brilliant. 1921, Le Ton explains um, 
that uh, when British policymakers are suspected of, of setting a long time in advance complicated snares for their adversaries or their friends, when they are stigmatised as typifying perfidious album, a profound error is committed. No greater mistake could make. There are no snares nor wiles in the British character. What is taken for perfidy is only egoism, robust, quiet and contented egoism, which is impossible to placate for the simple reason that it is unaware of its own existence. So that's, a, that's the French Le Ton, their assessment of the yep. British um, foreign officer, you know, uh, uh, character. And then the Russians... Red Army soldiers in 1927 are told that Perfidious Albion was intent on creating a ring of hostile powers. That's the first attempt to crush the Soviet. Because the other thing is the Soviet, the other, the other massive thing in all this is the Soviets. Of and course. You get, uh, uh, and throughout the 20s, there is this idea that there's, a, there's a, basically a Bolshevist undercurrent in all countries seeking to try and undermine. The, 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 and they're seeing, the, the British are seeing Reds, under, and they're not saying it, it, phrasing it this way, but they are seeing reds under the bed absolutely everywhere. Everywhere, um, and that's also feeding into British grand strategy. You know, this well, idea I mean, so if you look at look at Britain, and Britain has this has this ancient monarchy. It has um, it has an aristocracy, an entitled and ennobled aristocracy, and you cast her to Russia, yeah, which had all those things. Yep. but had them overthrown. Of course, yep. those people at the top of society are going yep. to be worried about the westward threat of communism. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, that, yeah. That's one of the, that is one of the reasons why so many people accept the Nazis in France for exactly the same reasons. Yep. It's, it's why so many people in Germany go along with the Nazis, because it's yep. a bulwark against yep. communism. But, but, this is, but for the British, it's global. So they're worried about Bolshevik intrigue in Afghanistan mm. in the 20s. They're worried about it in... In, in Iran, in Turkey, you know, that Turkey's going to go Bolshevik. And, that you know, that the, 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 they are, this is a big thing that is worrying the British strategic assessment of the world. And obviously that's, that's why in 1938, 39, you still can't quite bring yourself to do a deal with the Russians. Yes, exactly. Which is why in the, the opportunity in the spring and summer of 1939 goes begging. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when you do send negotiators out to Moscow, they're, they're, pretty sea list yeah yeah you know yeah. from both I mean, french and 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 british perspective yeah it's a fascinating book this though i mean i i would i would like i said when we start talking that you know the prop very often the problem is when people talk about the talk about this they start in 36 or they start in 33 yeah and you've really got to have the 20s you've got to go deep you've got to go you've got to or you just 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 10 years further back really mm. you know to to to, to sort of properly way what's going on i mean it's very i mean it's very interesting you know the contrast between chamberlain and churchill because churchill actually <laughs> at this at the time we're talking about is really bad at politics he is you know chamberlain is, is a party political operator supreme that's why he's prime minister that's why he's so popular as a prime minister that's why he's he's basically flipped a, na a national government into a conservative government in this you know it that's yep. what that's what happens in the 30s you know the, the, the late labor are basically squeezed out of the national government it's a tory government essentially churchill is you know in the wilderness the reason churchill's in the wilderness is he's really bad at politics he's bad at it for all his strategic nous and sense and assessment of 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 what german intentions are he's bad at part he's bad at he's bad with the conservative party he's crossed the floor twice no one trusts him he's he hangs out with really dodgy people. He takes cash for questions. He writes checkbook journalism. He's, he's, you know, he's bad at politics. And I think it's really, you know, that the, when the moment comes, you don't need someone who's good at politics anymore in 1940. You need someone who's good at, at you know, leading a nation rather than rather than doing the sort of uh, 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 the sort of dotting of eyes and crossing your T's. It, it, well, the crochet that being a yes. party politician is. You know, you need yeah. someone who's going to go out and. See it, see it in a different way, and I think that's really inter interesting. That the Churchill's gifts uh, um, uh, that, that people prize so highly when the war comes, no one's interested in much. Um, and Chamberlain's gifts, you know, which get him, which get you know, he's get him to nineteen forty as prime minister. There they go out. The, the need for those goes out the window as the situation changes. You know, right, right people is it's so interesting. I, I would, I mean, seriously, it, problem with this book. Um, before anyone rushes out and buys it, it's bloody expensive because it's an academic book. Yes. So I think the Kindle cost me forty quid. I think. Jeepers. 
So the well, whole I'm still is- reading Raising Churchill's Army, which is fascinating. Oh, really God, it's so good. I mean, just thank goodness that you've got these brilliant academics doing all this work oh, that we can yeah, then yeah, sort yeah, of digest yeah, at yeah, our leisure. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is such a good book. And, um, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean- when I get to the end of that, I wouldn't mind having another discussion on that one, to be honest. <laughs> there's, there's, there's plenty more to be said on that. I've yeah. been doing quite a bit of work on agriculture, which has been really, really interesting. Oh, really? And farming. Well, you know, farming was was completely in the doldrums because they, they did these um, – they encouraged everyone in the First World War to, to, to yeah. grow cereals because yeah. that's yeah. the most efficient use of your land. Yeah. Um, and, and then price protected. Right. And then the war, war's over and they, they whip away the price protection. So um, all these farmers that were on mixed farms with kind of, you know, cows and, and dairy cows yeah. and sheep and all the rest of it and a bit of corn, suddenly they they – got rid of all that they've just got yeah. crops and the oh, and the market's gone free because the you know the ships are coming back over from canada and north america yeah yeah and um uh, and the british farmers are shafted so british farming in the 1920s and 30s so it was these two great doldrums the first one was the sort of late part of the 19th century which is the yeah. backdrop to all those sort of thomas hardy novels like yeah. the Dervilles and stuff yeah and the jude um yeah. and that's when the first sort of um transatlantic refrigerated ships are coming across with with sort of beef in the Argentine and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. The second one is this this doldrum of the 1920s and 30s. And by the late 1930s, you know, a lot of farms have, have, have gone under. And the yeah. hedgerows are kind of are overgrown and the, the downland is covered with furs, you know, gauze. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and nature is reclaiming it. It's rewilded. Um, yeah. You know, and there's lots of sort of old farms with collapsed buildings with the sort of roofs caved in and broken farm machinery that no one uses and all that. And it's in a right state. And and so by 1939, only 14.1% of our food is produced at home in the UK, right. which right. is nothing. Yeah. And suddenly yeah. it's a war and you're thinking, okay, well, we, you know, there's no problem. We can still import it. But the problem is it's taking up shipping space. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that we can't, we can't continue to import food. It's yeah. that we need that shipping for other things. So yeah. then there is a huge ploughing up campaign and dig for victory, and everyone can play yeah. a part. So, you know, you start digging up your gardens and Hyde Park yeah. and yeah. front of Buckingham Palace and all that kind of stuff, and everyone's everyone's into it. And, of course, it's a genius act because it, it gives everyone a sense of we're all in uh, it together. Unification, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but sort of levelling of the social strata as well. So it's a, it's a double tick. Yeah. But what they do very cleverly is they've, they've been planning for this since 1938. And yeah. um, in 1939, they said in, they, they po- they're poised to do the War Acts, uh, yeah. which is the uh, War Agricultural Executive Committees. And so these are in every single county. And the idea is that you have centralised directives coming from the Ministry of Agriculture. Yeah. Um, but you, you feed that out to the War, the war Acts, the War Agricultural Committees, yeah. and they administer that so that oh. you're getting local knowledge to administer a centralised policy. Oh, that's clever. And, and there's a, there's a, a th- there are certain things, right? You know, we've got to plough up more land, but what they don't do is say, you know, it's not proportional representation or anything. You know, you know, in Wiltshire, you might have you might have a, a different amount required for East Anglia, yeah. or yeah, you know, mountainous area of the Cum- of Cumbria is not expected to produce as much as, you know, so it's, it's so it's all worked out according to 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 the different geography of the country. Who's the uh, Who's the minister doing this? Who's Who's in, Who's on? So, so, it, so it's it's William Morrison in in 1939, and he later becomes the minister for food, right? Um, rather than minister of agriculture, yes. but, uh, but yes. on his watch because he takes over in 1936, and obviously with appeasement and the and the Munich crisis and everything, not appeasement, yeah. but with the Munich crisis, yeah, everyone's get, thinking, okay, Christ, what do we what do we do? And yeah, so yeah, everything yeah. is set up, but it's not enacted. So. Right. In the summer of spring and summer of 1939, they're already working out who is going to be the head of who's going to be the chairman of the county war acts and who is going to be yeah. who's going to be on the committee. So they're working it out already. Yeah, and they ha- and these committees have incredible power to to. I mean, they can confiscate farms if if you if you're you know you get classified A, B, and C and everything. They, you know, they love yeah. their classifications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you know whether you're reaching your potential. And it's all, but it's all worked out. And so, what you're doing is you within the, your war ag, you've got committee members from every single area, and then there are subcommittee members between, right. you know. So, so yeah. where I am here in Salisbury, there's a there's a there's a district, yeah, where, and they're drawn from local farmers, so who know other farmers. Now, the problem is, of course, is that there's, if you're not careful, there's a sort of level of vindictiveness here. Yes, sort of, of course, you know, yeah, rival yeah, yeah. neighbours and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, but it's one of those things that. 
you just can't help that. Um, and, and what you've got to do is try and, and, and get the very best people and try and kind of eradicate those local yeah. rivalries and tensions yeah. Yeah. between neighbouring farmers and all the rest of it. Yeah. And, and it's sort of 90% successful. And, and that's as good as it's ever going to get. And yeah. the net result of that is, is you know, two and a half million extra acres of land ploughed up, wow. um, you know, in the first 18 months of the war, which is an incredible amount for a country as small as Britain. Yeah. And by 1945, check this out, we've gone from 14.1% to 91%. Jesus Christ. Feeding. Yeah, it's, it's, it is absolutely amazing. And the key thing about rationing, again, so it's really interesting because it's what you see is okay. What is the most profitable per per acre? Uh, and, and you know it is not beef cattle. <laughs> put it no, that no, way. No. So beef cattle, get get rid of them. Dairy, obviously, you still need dairy. So yeah. so dairies are all right. Um, uh, wheat is more is more productive per acre than yeah um, than um, than barley, for example. Right. So it goes from about two tons per acre in. 1938 yeah. to about three and a half, four tons per acre by, 19, by 1945. And that's revolutionary. It is revolutionary. So now it's about seven or eight, you know, with GM and, you know, yeah. modified crops and machinery yeah, yeah. and less. Yeah, I yeah. mean, we've, we've got 50% less hedgerows than we did in 1945. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But what you're getting is, is, is a huge amount of phosphates, nitrates, artificial fertilizers going in. Yeah. Um, you know, it is absolutely ruthless. Huge I mean, amounts of machinery going in because, of course, mach machinery yeah. reduces your requirement for manpower. Because yeah. even even if you are if you're a farm labourer, you are exempt from military service. Yeah. Uh, and particularly if you're if you're a machine, uh, if you're like a tractor driver, for example, on a yeah. farm, then you're even more exempt. Yeah, yeah. But obviously, a lot of these young men don't want to be exempt. They want to go and do their they want bit. To go fight. Yeah, 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 they yeah. want to go and fight because they're young men, and you know they feel emasculated yeah. if they don't, etc., yeah. etc. Yeah, yeah. So lots of them do. So the so the machinery is not only to make it more efficient; it's also to solve the problem of of that. But they thought about it beforehand. So they've got this huge Ford factory um, in Dagenham where they're making these Fords and tractors under license. And the government and the war rags have a pot in which they can buy m m machinery. And so yeah. Joe Bloggs, of his kind of, you know, his 50 acre farm, can't afford it. So yeah. they lend them to them. And they do kind of HP and all this kind of stuff. And, and, Amazing. And, yeah, to, to, so, that, so that a farmer who can't afford it can afford it or can, yeah. or can get access to it. And there's yeah. this incredible yeah. amount of flexibility in all this. And, and, the, and it's just so interesting because. You do have this total revolution in the way we farm. And one of the reasons why post-war um, the, the, the landscape is so abused by increased fertilisation yeah. and all the rest of it is because of the, the, the ball that has been set in motion by the Second World War. Yeah. And what they do yeah. at the end of the Second World War is go, right, we've got to be in a situation where we've got to be food, we've got to be food sufficient. So we yeah. have to price protect, all this kind of stuff. So the so 50s, 60s and early 70s are until we join the EU, EEC – are yeah. our time of absolute boom for farmers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is then, and then, and then instead of doing price protection in, in once we join the EEC, then it becomes yeah. subsidies for, you and, know, yeah. you get the butter mountains and all the rest of it. And, yeah, and agri agribusiness is sort of mutated by the effect of the, the EEC. Yeah, yeah, but, but that's why we're in a situation now, all these years later, that you've got, you know, chronic soil erosion, exhaustion yeah. of soil. Yeah. I mean, it's just got bigger and bigger, bigger, bigger tractors, fewer hedgerows, yeah. so, you know, the yeah. soil gets more compressed, so there's less earthworms, so there's less, you know, stuff yeah. going into it. There's more, you know, if you, if you constantly, you know, if you have a farm where, where most of your fields are arable, then what yeah. happens is you, you, you're you not allowed to burn the, burn the stubble anymore. Yeah. So you don't have that pushing back of carbon and stuff and nitrous back yeah. into the soil. And yeah. so what happens is the wind and the rain just wash away the topsoil. Because yeah. it's really there's no grass on it and there's, it's not being it's not being replenished by sheep and this is a problem of you know going off on one yeah. but this yeah, is yeah, why yeah. why why kind of you know total veganism doesn't work because you need animals to kind of be yeah. crapping on it and all the rest of it and working in the clover and blah 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 yeah. anyway but but all this is good. so there's this huge transformation in the in the Second World War and it is absolutely extraordinary the whole point of rationing is yeah. is not that we're short of food it's to make sure. That no one that, that we're not we're not we're not wasteful with our food it's to keep it under control, isn't it? It's, it's to keep it under control, and it's to make sure that everyone gets a balanced diet. Because yeah. before there was absolute abject poverty. You know, some yeah. of these sort of you know industrial towns yeah. in in the kind of sort of real working class areas. You know, people living off bread and dripping and all that kind of stuff. Now they're getting a balanced diet with. 
proper vitamins and carbohydrates and protein yeah, and all yeah, the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, less. And so so ne- the nation has never been fitter. And that's great news because it means that, you, you know, your guys going off to war are, are, are fit and healthy, but it also means the guys in the factory are fit and healthy. And if they're fit and healthy, they have less days sick, which means your production goes up. And the counterpoint of that, of course, is the German way, which is have lots of slave labour, which you really yeah. undernourish, and they, you know, yeah, yeah, you work yeah, yeah, yeah. Death, and their, their production is, is, is well, worse. Well, the Soviet man way is man. to <laughs> Soviet way is the collective farm that starves its occupants as well, because you've yeah. politicised farming itself. God, how interesting, Jim. Yeah, it really is interesting. It's been absolutely fascinating doing this. Um, and one of the guys who was one of the most prolific writers about, about farming in the Second World War and indeed in the 1930s, is a guy called A.G. Street. And he lived literally about six, seven miles away from where I am at Ditchhampton mm. Farm, which was at Wilton. And yeah. he's fascinating. He wrote this book, which he published in, I think, early 1944 called Hitler's Whistle. Right. And um, it's, a, it's about his farm and farming and, and you know, the, how, how the farming community considers itself the four farm. Of yeah. the armed services, you know, this is absolutely vital. Amazing. And there are people like Laurie Lee are writing writing essays and booklets yeah. and pamphlets for the yeah. government and stuff. I mean, it's it's yeah. you know, and it's beautifully crafted, and it's and it's tapping into this notion of the great yeoman of of England. And, yes, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. And, you know, and as soon as you start reading this stuff, you're immediately thinking sort of sheaves of golden corn, and you know, yeah. And sort yeah. of the, the distant bleat of sheep on the chalk downlands, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it really and shepherd's crooks and whatnot. I mean, yeah. it is absolutely amazing. It's you know, it's it's it has this incredibly powerful resonance. All this writing, even yeah. now. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, I you, you say that in the in the bucolic um, uh, chalk valley. As I, I I wonder whether reading it here in uh, West London with a with a bloody A four going past my anyway. Um, it, yes. It, well, you might feel even more nostalgic. I, I mean, might even, yes, it might, I might, I might have hankerings for Albion. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably all we got time for, Jim. Yeah. Um, this Thursday, by the way, everybody, we've got an American themed episode as James catches up with Rob Satino to discuss Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Um, thanks Stay everyone for listening. Me. Don't forget, uh, we have wastefest.co.uk for all your um, Second World War festival needs. Um, 22nd to the 24th of July in Buckinghamshire. We look forward to seeing you there. Thanks everyone for listening. See you soon. Bye bye. Cheerio.